Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 566. If you do your math correct, that means we're 100 away from 666. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's well, whatever day of the week it is, but it's, it's the 14th of January. <laughs> I have four sixes in my telephone number, and it's astonishing how anxious people get. <laughs> I say, no, there's four, not three. It's all okay. <laughs> All right, welcome to the talk in Revelation. No, 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 no. So before we get too far, um, every week I sit down and I explain your responsibility as a, a faithful viewer to this program. And for the next minute, I'm gonna do the same thing again because we need your help. Um, you love the program. You want other people to know about the program. I'm going to tell you how to do that. First and foremost, if you see a thumb anywhere on the screen with our faces above it, the three of us, like it just click that thumb and it lets the algorithms at facebook and youtube know this is something it needs to pay attention to you also need to share there's a url that's that thing at the very top uh, that has the address of the show you, you send that to your friends your enemies people you think need to know what we're talking about you also need to comment oh you guys love to comment we're going to talk about the comments some of them today we picked out a couple to talk about and the cool thing is, this program doesn't end in 40 minutes when I click the off button. It ends months down the road because you guys keep the topic going. You add your perspective. You add things we forgot about. There's like three or four trolls out there. We know who you are. It's fine. You're just a small amount of the comments. That's okay. And we are just astounded that this continues down there. I'm astounded that only 50% of our audience has subscribed to Anglican Unscripted. You make it sound like it's something hard, like donating to the show or sending us PayPal money. No, it's not that hard. There's a little red rectangle. I'm looking at it right now, and I'm gonna put it on the screen for you. It says subscribe. If that's not red, you've already subscribed. But if it's red, you have not. You click it, and boom, a little bell pops up, and you click the bell, and you'll get an instant notification every time I post an Anglican TV video, which are primarily Anglican unscripted. There, I did my spiel. Now do your spiel and uh, click subscribe, like, share, comment. And for the rest of you, there's a podcast. There are people here who just don't have time during the week to sit and watch us talk face to face. You can listen to us in the car on the way to work. We appreciate that. In the show notes, there's a podcast link. Click it, enjoy. <sighs> so, What's there to talk about? Um, I was going to talk about uh, Harry and Meghan, but we can save that till later. Uh, in our pre-show, um, Gavin was talking about a documentary he watched uh, last night on the BBC about... Uh, what time is it there? Four o'clock. Four o'clock. We do need to hurry because uh, Mrs. Ashenden is going to be cooking dinner soon, I assure you, and we need to, to get uh, Gavin out of his seat. But you were watching a documentary of the BBC uh, about Peter Ball, and uh, I thought it's something to talk about because you said this is absolutely devastating to the Church of England, and there's lots of layers of failures here. And, well, one of the things we like to do is talk about failures on Anglican Scripture. We can cover this. Uh, tell us a little bit about the first part you saw last night and how this affects uh, the Church of England. And we'll talk a little about the la layers of well, failure. Well, what people may not know is we've done this once in the pre-show and once in the show, and this is now the post-show. So post I'm not... <laughs> so, <laughs> you better know your stuff by now, Gavin. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting how one's emotions change. I, I remember the first time we... We, we covered this together. I was livid and furious, and now I just have a bad taste in my mouth. Um, the, there was a video, uh, a video. there was a documentary on Peter Ball, and one of my first feelings is shame because I was taken in by Peter Ball for such a long time, though I didn't have all the information that we had last night in the video. It turns out there was a good deal of undressing, uh, a good deal of, 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 of the, the whipping of adolescent boys naked and other such things could i could i pause you and say gavin who was peter ball 
and what did he and why would there be a documentary about him? Yeah, in fact, that's yes. just, hold on, George. That's point. really important because we always forget our audience is growing and new people don't know, you know, last year's episode or uh, we've been doing this almost seven years. So give us a little intro to Peter Ball, please. Peter Ball died a few months ago in his late 80s. So uh, he was an Anglican, first of all, monk and then a bishop. He was a pair of, belonged to a pair of twins who started their own monastic movement and uh, he was a glamorous monk bishop in the Church of England in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, he was an immensely charismatic man, um, and he looked like a holy man. Uh, insofar as any of us knows what holiness looks like, he modeled it really quite well. He was enigmatic, always dressed in flowing robes. Uh, he appeared to be ascetic. Uh, he certainly put on a show of humility, though it turns out it covered a great deal of uh, self-regard underneath. Um, but but um, he was a great performer. I was one of the people who knew him quite well, and I remember watching him perform in front of an international conference of psychiatrists whom he evangelized and charmed like nobody else I've seen in my life. I found it very difficult to believe the things that people were saying about them. And if, mind you, if I'd known at the time that what was being actually claimed was the things that, that I, I won't list them again, I, I think perhaps I would have been more willing to see the truth. But it was, again, all that was said was he, he was had accusations brought against him for being over intimate with young men, whatever that meant. When you hear the story as the BBC tells it, uh, particularly through the mouth of three very moving men of integrity in their mid-40s saying this was how I was psychologically seduced and then wrecked by this holy man. So that's the first thing. But the really, really upsetting thing for me was not not hearing, not just hearing a policeman complain that he lied through his teeth when he was interviewed, uh, the policeman being very surprised a bishop would do that. But the bit that moved me most of all was that next to the bishop lived a couple. Um, I would say they're they're a bit like janitors. It was about they 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 had practical jobs around the cathedral. And one day this boy came into them in a dreadful state and said, "The bishop wants to whip me again, and I can't take it." And they didn't know what to do. They'd never heard that this was outside their remit, as it was as it would be outside ours. So they took him to Lambeth Palace, where there's a bishop in residence. It's called the Bishop at Lambeth. And he's the kind of troubleshooter. And they said, we don't know what to do. Here is, here is the boy. What, what do we do that one of your colleagues wants to whip him and he's in fear and trembling? And the Bishop at Lambeth said, I will deal with this. this. This is most unusual, but leave it to me. I will deal with it. He didn't deal with it. They discovered later on nothing had been done. And they were as horrified by that as they were by the prospect of a bishop chastising, whipping somebody naked. So the difficulty th is that, that, that this not doing anything continued. It went right up the ladder. It went to George Carey. And again, I knew that Jared Carey had six letters, but on the, on the BBC documentary, they read them out. And I said, I didn't know they said that. <laughs> I didn't know they were that explicit. I'd given Carey the benefit of some doubt. And then the long list of people who did nothing all the way through. And then, as we'll say, a whole group of, of, of very, very well connected people from a law lord whose books I used to read as a student, immensely clever professor of jurisprudence, a member of the House of Lords, to a very upstanding conservative MP, hundreds of letters from the establishment poured in to try and make the police put the brakes on it. And there at the centre of it, you had these let me say, how do how do I not use class language? Uh, people at the lower ends of the echelon, a hard-working policeman, very down to earth, a hard-working janitor and his wife, as good as gold, and the whole of the establishment in the name of Anglicanism and religion, squeezing the integrity out of them to stop them defending this poor man who, in the end, killed himself. And the 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 the, the documentary is in the mouths of these 
now you know grown-up men in their 40s saying this was how bad it was they're quite tough guys that they, they, you know you look you look at them and think but you look you look full of integrity and and tough and it, it happened to you and you survived it's astonishing the second part is tonight and i must say i found myself saying can an organization survive this level of exposure of hypocrisy mendacity incompetence and as we'll say tribalism it's it it's terrifyingly bad and i'm and i'm very very sorry because of course we know that it stretches across denominations this is not an anti-anglican thing this is this is uh, an this is the failure of human beings our age it's my failure every time i take the easy way out i'm i'm sipping the same sup of corruption as mm -hmm. as as all the corrupt people in the story it's only a matter of how far the corruption goes um, but I was very shocked indeed by seeing this documentary on the BBC, and I still am. May I give a little bit more background? Um, Ball had been a Suffragan bishop in the Diocese of Chichester, and the bishop there, Eric Kemp, um, just who was a man of deep integrity, deep learning, a very powerful leader of the Anglo-Catholic movement, concluded that all the accusations against Ball were people getting up to mischief to destroy the Anglican witness. And then Ball was advanced to become Bishop of Gloucester. And he w was finally asked to uh, step down as Bishop of Gloucester after police complaints were made of him behaving inappropriately. So only the merest surface accusations were made. And this was, I think, in 92 or 93. And then Ball spent the next 15 years trying to rehabilitate himself and he became uh, he was always friends with Prince Charles and Prince Charles gave him a house to live in for free that belonged to the Duchy of Cornwall and Ball had his he if you will seduced the leaders of society of the law of the government of the monarchy of the church into all thinking that these are just people who had a sympathy for Christianity, sympathy for the for the Anglican way, uh, Ball seduced them into saying that attacks against me are attacks against what we stand for as Christians. Finally, the, poli the, uh, the police did a second round of interviews and, uh, and investigations 10, 15 years after the fact, and this is the police officer that Gavin cites in the documentary, where, where found Ball was engaged in ongoing rape. Of young George, man who George, was I, I, I need to stop you here because the horrifying thing is the policeman I'm talking about was the first investigation. The establishment managed, despite I, I don't want to give all the details because they, they will disturb our readers and they're, they're not necessary, but they're pretty graphic. But but the the fact is the establishment managed to get ball off on a deal that if he if he acknowledged some minor misdoing, some minor offense against a, a minor person. They wouldn't pursue it but you know they knew enough from the first interview we know enough because they they they, they replay the interview tapes read by actors it's inconceivable that knowing what was known by the police then they would ever do a deal to let such a man off and the the complaints against the victims are exactly this that the establishment bought him time after which instead of repenting and being quiet and and um, perhaps sorting his soul out, he went on a seduction spree of self-justification. Um, and I've no idea whether or not he engaged in further bad behavior, but 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 his attempts to um, to demean the witnesses, to tell the establishment he was actually okay to continue this narrative of self-deception and tribal loyalty this continued and i'm beginning i'm i'm you know for those of you who are victims and 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 we've been in touch already uh, i'm really sorry i've been so slow to see the enormity of the conspiracy and the bad behavior i've been getting it bit by bit but 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 i now seeing it graphically played out in front of in front of me in this documentary where the very words are used i'm i'm appalled at how slow i was and i'm i'm ter i'm very upset indeed that there are still so many victims around who are not properly believed and for whom the establishment has never taken any reparative action 
but you use the word inconceivable and we always look back and say how did this happen how did this person who's a wonderful teacher who clearly knows at least visually we see through his teaching you know the lord he knows uh, jesus and i'm being affected by his ministry how can this person be so fallen and broken and hurting other people and there's just no denomination without sin in this there's cover up after cover up and everybody looks back and say that's inconceivable look at jim and tammy faye baker in the united states look mm -hmm. at jimmy swaggart look at uh, john Carapi, the television priest catholic priest i would watch i would listen to his podcast then i can still listen to them and they teach really good stuff look at the cardinal mccarrick whose behavior in many ways was identical to peter balls yeah, and how did how did these things come to be um is it now gavin do you prince charles is tarred by this the arch the former archbishop mm -hmm. of canterbury is tarred by this what's worth the fallout going to be what do you believe the fallout will be from these documentaries I, I, in one sense, the fact that Charles is tarred by it and Kerry is tarred by it and I'm tarred by it, I believed him. Um, I, I, don't think, I don't think that's the issue. As I hear it, the issue is a whole chain of people who should have acted. And if any of them have acted, the thing might have been dealt with more quickly. And still the victims are still saying, but you haven't acted properly. Still there is the the desire to, to, to allow insurance companies to dictate the terms on which things are done, to allow lawyers to protect an institution's reputation. Still, there is the, 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 the implications that the victims are mentally unwell and can't quite be trusted. Um, but but the, the thing that blew it up for me was that the detail, when, when you hear the detail in this, in this documentary, you then say to yourself, how is it possible that anybody who had access to this detail d did nothing? Um, I, I, I mean, I, I, I think the implication of the documentary is that the, how, the Church of England is yet under, is yet um, unclean. It, it, it hasn't held people to account for not dealing with it. Um, some of them are dead now, perhaps, but um, I also think that there's an element that 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 we are in the dying ends of a civilization uh, i think we'll look back we might get onto roger scruton later but but uh, the, next, uh, next. Uh, our civilization is is dying fast and i think many of us over the last 30 years have had this terrible terrible sense that christianity is failing that our civilization our culture is failing and we don't know why and, and we don't know what to do about it and therefore when someone like peter ball and F Jonathan Fletcher turn up and they say, we're good at this, we can reverse this, believe in us, watch us, admire us uh, and, and see how it's really done. Some of us go, wow, that's such a relief, I don't need to worry anymore because, because the A-team are here. Um, and then there are other elements, I, Satan is real, he lays traps for the gifted, uh, we are weak and corrupt, and many of us take the easy way out all too often. There is the ghastly tribalism that, that, that puts secular loyalty above faithfulness to Christ and to the truth. It's a very difficult mix. It turns out that staying clean, holding on to integrity, and being holy is really more difficult than some of us thought it was. <laughs> Though I'm well, finding it's getting harder as I'm getting older. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do talk about uh, uh, Sir Roger Scranton, who uh, passed away this week. A uh, philosopher, uh, conservative, and certainly a person who had an interesting take on religion and God and the role in society. And uh, I'm a big fan of his documentary, Why Beauty Matters. I love his work but i don't think it's christian work i you know and i we're not here to talk about whether or not he's he's on his way to glory that's not this this topic but philosophy also wants to discover the and try and identify the ills of man so that it can overcome them just as much as, as christianity does and i think roger uh in his great wealth of 50 books and uh um 
I like him because he's a cigar smoker. But in his, his great wealth of writing, always tried to you know find man's role in philosophy, in religion, in work, in society, in homeland, uh, in, in the works of uh, Britain and in the UK. And you know I admire him for that. But I'm just looking at him from an American Western standpoint. He was certainly more admired in England, Gavin. He was hated in England. Uh, I, I think there are, no, I think there are, right. <laughs> there, are, there are two things that strike me. Um, one is the fact that he was in love with aesthetics, truth, beauty, music, order, intelligence. And he really valued the church. I sat down yesterday to read his book on, on the Church of England that he loved. And um, it was very interesting to see what, what goodness and virtue he recognized in it. Uh, both aesthetically and culturally and intellectually, but he never fell in love with Jesus and he didn't have a sense of sin. And in the end, the critical thing was, um, Anselm has this beautiful phrase, uh, I believe in all that I, that I may understand. Um, and Scruton said, actually, I can't go there. Uh, I understand in order that I may try to believe and I can't quite pull the belief thing off. And my understanding, my analysis of that is that, uh, that that it's very tempting for all of us to to have an alternative God to the living God who made us, whom we would rather trust if we could, perhaps because we get on better with him. And Scruton, it was intelligence. Scruton, like the Greeks, preferred the power of intelligence and the power of reason, the power of analysis over a love affair with a living God who would who would otherwise have looked at him and said, my, you're dirty and broken. You need to surrender to me and let me clean you up. <laughs> and then you'll love me forever. And, and, and Scruton hadn't had that experience. And George, I think, was going to mention that this applied to other people too, unless you want to go on with the Scruton thing, George. No, I think well, I, I, I did want to follow up quickly about Scruton as far as he was asked time and time again about afterlife in interviews and, you know, his thoughts on Jesus and his thoughts on religion. And he, his response was basically, listen, if anybody should know, I should know, just through intelligence. But I just don't, I don't get the afterlife. I don't understand it. It's just not me. Oh, but I hope it's there. That was, that's the way his, his interviews came off when he talked about that type of stuff. Well, Gavin, I, I think there's a bit, we have a phenomenon at my parish of having people show up on Christmas and Easter because they love the music, they love the liturgy. And I talk to them, and I said, well, why don't you come the rest of the year? Oh, well, we're not that religious. We're Episcopalians. <laughs> and and uh, they come for, if you will, the cultural aesthetics aspects of the church. Now, is Scruton on that level, or is there something more to him? Yeah, no, these are mini Scrutons. I think these are very good people who recognize goodness and beauty and truth. Um, uh, I was listening to a historian called Lord Sumption say that one of the things that made him an Anglican uh, was was that at Eton he he fell in love with the music, uh, and I can understand that. And there are there are Greeks in the New Testament who said, "Sir, we'd like to see Jesus. We're quite interested in this clever, this clever magic man who uh, who has attracted us." But the New Testament makes it clear that lots of people are on the trail of God because they recognize truth, love, goodness, beauty, all the aesthetic values. But when they encounter him in Christ, something extra has to happen. There has to be a moment of complete uh, helplessness and surrender. That's what salvation is. And Scruton was one of the more intelligent, gifted people for whom that last step became impossible because like the rich man in the parable, he was very rich. <laughs> he was very clever indeed. And he would have to have given up his cleverness. And we don't know whether the rich young man went away and gave up his riches. So the people who come, the Episcopalians who come to church, they would have to give up probably their autonomy, I think. Because to be a Christian means this act of complete surrender where you realize you get to hold on to nothing. Anything you want saved has to be given up in order to be saved. And people don't want to give it up. So I think Scruton is the virtuous Gentile, uh, the virtuous Greek, who knew such a lot, recognized so much of God, but failed to be born again, 
uh, failed at first from, sight to be from saved. What, from what we know, we're not. From you know, what we, we know, we, from, no, no. Yeah. What, what the Lord does in judgment, you know. He, I mean, <laughs> the, the, the danger is when I get there, He may say to me, uh, you know, Gavin, I gave you so much and you didn't deliver. So, of those who much is given, much is expected. Yes, um, I, I'm not suggesting for a moment that we know how the Lord will treat people, but mm. um, but we are called all the same to make it as clear as we can to human beings that it isn't enough to admire God. You actually have to let him love you and mend you so you can love him back. Finding Screw. the beauty of, uh, in Christ and finding the beauty in creation, finding the beauty in God is not the standard. Yes. Nicodemus is the standard. Yes. Scruton was a political philosopher. Now that, he, that was his field where he focused and he had many other interests. And he was in his early 70s when he passed away this week. Um, so, and for many of our audience, he, it may be a name that you've heard of, but you've not really engaged. And, but many people in our audience will have heard of, will have watched the videos of Jordan Peterson. Now, Peterson is not a political philosopher, he's a psychologist, but they seem to be advancing along the same arc or trajectory. Uh, of recognizing the truth of Christianity, but not willing to make that final surrender. Is that a fair? Yes, I, it, it is. I'd, I'd like to add too, and one of the things I failed to say about Scruton was, as I've read a number of his obituaries, uh, I, I hadn't realized the venom, the vituperation, the attacks, the unfairness, the character assassination that the progressive left visited upon him, stopping him earning his living as one of the country's foremost conservative intellectuals. Uh, conservative because he said to be a conservative is to be a person who loves but loves family loves place loves loves locality um, and wants to look after them uh, I was again I'm reminded we live in a time of very serious crisis just to talk about truth and beauty and 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 conserving values that make our civilization led to an outpouring of hatred against him. And the same thing has been true of Jordan Peterson. So Peterson, like Scruton, uh, again, it seems to me we're dealing with the early years of church history. Um, there are a number of, of uh, heresies which keep on reappearing and also infecting the church. And so um, uh, P Peterson is a kind... So, so if, if anything, um, Scruton is, is something like a Platonist or a Neoplatonist. He, by philosophy, he gets very close indeed to the gospel, very close indeed to Jesus, but wants to try and tip it towards philosophy rather than towards salvation and redemption. And Scruton is a Gnostic, um, and Jordan Peterson is a Gnostic. Uh, his philosophy is a new kind of uh, psychology. I'm sorry, I'm misspeaking. Psychology is a new kind of Gnosticism. It's a way of knowing, having special knowledge. Peterson's very good at it. He's he's done. He's been on the receiving end and the giving end of therapy, and his Gnosticism has brought him to a recognition of Christian archetypes as being profoundly true. But as you hear him talk about them, you realise he's fonder of his Gnosticism than he is of Jesus. He's not yet been been come to a point, although with his illness he may be soon, and his poor wife's mortality, her cancer, he hasn't yet come to the point where he realises that the only way forward is not his expertise uh, and his his profound map of human nature, but a surrender to the living God who made him again. So we have two alternative ways of getting word to the truth, but they stop at the threshold of being born again and of living in the spirit in the kingdom of heaven. Kevin is right. Nicodemus, or at least the conversation with Nicodemus, is is the model and the the way in that people have to go. It's, it's it's the standard people you know if they ask you gavin or george or kevin how do i get to heaven let me refer you <laughs> to the conversation with the rich man or with nicodemus uh and but, but, but look at the rage if i so i mean case I, i'm sorry sure, kevin go ahead. yeah no go go go, go. The, the thing that i've been really struck by for both scruton and peterson is the livid diabolic rage that are that, that our new establishment the media, political correctness, those who run universities, those who deal with public attitudes. Both these men have, have 
have come as close to being broken as is possible, both personally and professionally. And why? Because they told something of God's truth in the public space in a way that Christians have failed to do. We we have cried off. We've been so scared. We haven't done it. They've taken the heat for us, these, these brave men. So although I may sound as I'm criticizing them and critiquing their spiritual journey, I want to I want to acknowledge their courage and their provocation of evil, and evil has set out to crush them. And the reason I say that is I think we have to recognize that we as Christians face the same dynamic. If we tell the truth in the public space, evil will turn its attention to us and be most unpleasant. <laughs> I know, both Roger and, and Peterson would tell you, you know, the biggest fight we have is the progressives trying to change what words mean. You know, and that's where their battlefield is. And their battlefield is this drama and this this anger and these these uh, social uh, internet social attacks on Twitter. You know, and I can't we can't fight that because the universities are capitulating, at least in Europe, um, uh, to this left and right. So and, and uh, the media and the police and the uh, armed yeah. forces. Yeah. The the, uh, the 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 Grasky march to the institutions has been well achieved. Uh, we got like 10 minutes left here in the, in the broadcast, if I'm looking at that correctly. Let's talk about some fun news. And, and in my book, that's royal news. Royal news. Uh, I know you guys have been paying attention. The whole world has been paying attention. I guess the universe. The Queen has called the family back together for a little tete-a-tete on what to do with the Harry and Meghan problem. And uh, for those who really haven't been paying attention, last week Harry and Meghan said, we want to take a step back from senior royal duties now i love history monarchy history and in my book that means they're going to be beheaded imagine <laughs> my disappointment yesterday afternoon when i'm reading that they actually have an agreement with the queen of where they can step back and kind of live in canada for a little while whilst they get their act together and decide how they can make money that doesn't belong to charles and I, <laughs> may I inter, inter, interject that please the daily, the daily mail tells us that they've chosen canada because they will not move to los angeles their ultimate destination so long as donald trump is president so Once these again, four people I, are going to have to brave some toronto winters unless they make it down to the caribbean to mystique or whatnot as formal royalty i think their greatest marketing job uh ability will be some something to do with disney uh, you know, evil stepmothers. That uh, Disney loves uh, monarchies and royalty in in their storytelling. But uh, let's get the latest from Gavin as to the um, how the average Englishman. Kevin, Kevin, you joke, but uh, Megan oh. has signed a contract with Disney to do voiceover work for animated films. <clears throat> Tell me, evil stepmother, evil stepmother, please, no. <laughs> Disney heroine. Um, Gavin, give us the, the take of the average English person walking the streets of London and how they feel about um, Harry and Meghan's d decision not to be royal as royal should be. Well, of course, I can't do that, but because it's a good archetypal story, as Jordan Peterson yeah. would say, the, 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 its effect is it holds up a mirror to all of us. So, so you know, if... if um, if your kids have been misbehaving, then you see this as a triumph of grandma. <laughs> and you may find there's a most beautiful picture on the Times. You may be able to put it up. I'll send it to you. Where, sure. where Harry and grandma are having a kiss. And it's radiant with love. It's really beautiful. And you think, hey, grandma won. That's lovely um, for, for the moment, of course. Because I think all that's happened is she, by her kindness, her goodness, her discipline, she has stopped meltdown. You'll find other people looking at this story and saying, um, horrible racist Britain drives out this beautiful, vulnerable, fragile, entrepreneurish breath of fresh air who was the only hope the monarchy had as it disappears down its own fundamentals. And um, so these are people who see everything in the form of, of racism and they're quite convinced that racism has triumphed. Um, when it's pointed out to them that there isn't racist, there's nothing racist in any of the, the papers, uh, and Meghan was adored by the whole country um, in, in, with her exotic DNA, as someone called it. Um, they then say that, that, that racism is in the eye of the beholder, and if you don't see it, it's because you're racist. You don't need evidence. It's just a fact of life. 
Um, so we, this is every man's story. It's every family story. Perhaps it's every culture story. It's the balance between, well, as Scruton would say, the love of the particular, the, the love of those who want to live somewhere, which is the royal family and conservation, against the love of those who live anywhere, which is the elite, which is actually Harry and Meghan. Uh, and for the moment, the, the, the elite who want to live anywhere have not managed to destroy the institution that wants to live somewhere. Um, the, the, the notion that you could be a progressive force for a conservative monarchy is, is like saying, um, I'm going to use some oil to dilute the water. It's, it's, it's um, the whole point about a monarchy is it's not progressive. It slows us down. It it glues things together that would otherwise be sent spinning to the four winds. It to give us time to work out what is good and healthy. Pro progressive stuff belongs elsewhere. It belongs in it belongs in parliament. It belongs in universities where people test the edges. So this this dear couple have mistaken the task. If you belong to the most conserving agency possible don't go in to try and unglue it it's the wrong thing to do so grandma's made sure they've been bought some more slack and they can look after their mental health in canada where everyone is very mentally well and, um, and <laughs> <laughs> well one thing well, i wanted I you know i hear my background now that's her so one thing i want to talk about quickly is every 12 years and it's not 10 years it's not 14 I hear, should we abolish the monarchy? Is this is is a time now? Should we take? Should we just go on and be a regular uh, government in England and, and uh, abolish the queen and uh, all that extra tax care money and all the the uh, crystals and chandeliers and candles? Should we just get rid of it? And I tell you, the queen has once again overcome any of that talk in my mind. But is it time that we abolish the monarchy? Is well, there's monarchy a much more in old fast fashion government. There's a much more insidious idea, Kevin, than that, and that is: shall we change the family? <laughs> this is the, this is the Stuart to Hanoverian moment in reverse. Mm -hmm. You remember the Stuarts disgraced themselves mainly by becoming Catholic, as I remember, and so they invited in some good German Protestants. And so there are some people who are saying, well, the good German Protestants seem to have run out of of DNA uh, and and competence, and so let's bring back the Stuarts. And there's this lovely Stuart couple from Spain, I think, who look smart and sensible, and saying, well, what we need is a restoration of one of the different line of of the monarchy see if a different family can do monarchy better the hanoverians have run out of steam i think that's more likely than the abolishment abolition of the monarchy because after all you republicans don't seem to make a better job of it uh, when you deal with just naked money and power um so at, at least you know if it's queen the queen or obama i know who i'd prefer <laughs> all right so i gave you guys each an assignment at the last uh part of last week's episode off air i didn't tell uh our listeners and viewers what was going to happen but I said let's pick a comment we're not going to talk about the comment we're going to read the comment to let people know that we actually see their comments in the future we will have a comment show like maybe once a month that we'll go through and pick the best comments and talk about them but I wanted to prove to you that we read the comments and I, I'm talking to you Sandra uh, Combs uh, I <laughs> we read your comments now uh, let, let me back up here. The people who say, Kevin, you're right, you're very highly likely to have your comment read. It just, it's just <laughs> the nature <laughs> of getting your comment read on Angle Conscripted. So Sandra says, I've just read all the comments to this show, and she did this three days ago, and they are all fantastic. I agree. So many well thought out and reasoned comments, though many differ in opinions. Guess the comments section really is alive, Kevin. Blessings to all. A great, generic, wonderful comment. There's another guy who every week says thanks for the program. That's all he says, which is awesome. It shows that he takes the time to log on and, 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 and say such. Now, there are very incredibly theologically high-minded people who also comment, which we'll address in the future, um, that outsmart all three of us. They're just wise beyond years uh, and it'd be fun to talk about them in the future. Gavin, do you have a comment that struck out to you? 
and do, though it's going to be very difficult not to want to go on and on about its virtues at length. Um, but 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 the runners up: Dre G, brilliant; Jim Suttard, brilliant; Twenty Two Greener, whoever you are. Um, <laughs> So 22 Greener says, I think it was the last episode that mentioned that Gavin is now a Catholic and the program's title may be redundant, but that you would play play it by ear. Well, thank you for playing it by ear. I'm still in my seat just. But all great drama and art is created by contrast. And so this is a winning formula proved by the Mr. Chan discussion and the clear, interesting division of, division of opinion of the three. Christianity needs these types of discussion. A house divided is a house fallen. Christianity Unscripted is your new title of your show. That, so that's a very interesting comment. And the reason I wanted to use it was because my basic ecclesiology is that of Leslie Newbiggin. And what Newbiggin said, there's this amazing book, and, and, and I'll go on and on about this. But he said, the prob in the 20th century, the church is divided between the Church of the Father and the Church of the Son and the Church of the Holy Spirit. And, and he, re he reckoned that the Church of the Father was the Catholic and the Orthodox, the Son is, of course, Protestantism, and the Holy Spirit is, is Pentecostalism. And he said, we desperately need the Trinity to be united in the pragmatic expression of our ecclesiology. And what we have to do is to bring these three elements of the church together. And so I'd like to invite our listeners not to worry too much about the fact that Kevin belongs to this zany heretical group called the ACNA, <laughs> split off from them. And, and nor, nor, nor to be upset that, that George... That George is 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 the brother of Catherine Jefferson Shorey ecclesiastically. <laughs> we do not do guilt by association on this show, and nor the fact that I'm in the same church as McCarrick. <laughs> but <Indeed>. but <laughs> that, that 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 what we're trying to get is a is a Trinitarian unity of I won't say unity and diversity because that's now got such a bad odor to it. We we we're trying to bring together uh, the richness of the charisms that God has given His Church. I make a distinction between the charisms and the perversions. And if we make a mistake from time to time, bear with us. We're only three middle-aged men <laughs> making our way towards heaven slowly. If but we surely. make a mistake, that's what the comment section is for. <laughs> George, George, what do you got? What do you got? Well, well Miss Emily, Emily Batella. Oops. I'm sorry, I've got... You, there, it's better. Miss Emily Latella of Fort Lee, New Jersey, wants to know why we're always going on and on about endangered feces. And uh, I think she may have a misapprehension of what we're speaking about. For those who are not of a certain generation, that was a very common gag line from Saturday Night Live. It was. And it, uh, from Gilda Ratner, when, it, when she would do uh, comments, read them on uh, the news. The... Uh, I'm going to paraphrase because I don't have them in front of me. I'm not as skillful switching between this screen and my text screen. But a number of people said that essentially say, why are you being so hard on Francis Chan? He means well. And I think I think you need to understand that we come at this from different perspectives. As Gavin has stated, we have different theological underpinnings. Um, Gav and also we have different theological interests. Gavin. Uh, thinks deeply about soteriology and ecclesiology. I am, I like to read those, but they don't have the same place in my schema. Um, John Calvin is credited with saying that I'm a theologian in order that I may be a preacher. And the touchstone for me in how I seek to model my ministry are actually two or three different people who are who the world would say are very different. One is Richard Baxter, the author of The Reformed Pastor. The other is uh, St. John Vianney uh, and Francis mm -hmm. de Sales. And that for me, Pastoralia, the actual work of the pastor in the church. And so when I hear somebody who doesn't have theology preaching, my gut and instinctive reaction is that this man is glorifying himself. This is one, on some people, you have extended stream of consciousness. In the Episcopal Church, you get these people who read the New York Times op-ed or they listen to the latest uh, CNN broadcast and they regurgitate uh, polite and popular thinking as a sermon. Then you have other people who re recreate and rediscover Christianity in themselves. Whereas my understanding of the role of the pastor is that he stands on the shoulders of men and women who have gone before him for 2,000 years 
And if you're not going to take the time to know what you're talking about, you should keep your mouth shut. So here we have a very popular preacher who uh, some people said, oh, isn't it wonderful that he's being honest? Yes, it's wonderful that he's being honest, but if he's honest, he should then shut up and read what he seeks to be honest about instead of going on, because what you do, uh, Richard Baxter has a wonderful line, uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pastors who are in hell, even though they got up every Sunday thinking they were talking about Jesus, when in reality they were talking about themselves. Now, I'm not I'm not saying where, where uh, <clears throat> Chan's eternal destination is, that's not my call, but I'm saying there are, and you know, the Jimmy Swaggerts and the Jim and Tammy Faye Bakers and the Peter Balls and, and the you, Jonathan you Fletchers. I'm not lumping Francis Chen with them. He's done wonderful work, but he has a responsibility of a pastor to do the prep work, and he hasn't done it. Can I add something, George? George, I think you're the cleverest of our of the three of us by by a very long way. And and Kevin, you're the most gifted because as a, you, you 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 as an entrepreneur, you, you know what you've done is marvelous. The, the fact is, I found my way by making mistakes. Really, I'm I, Jordan Peterson speaks for me when he says, uh, only by articulating something can you discover if it's any good or not. And so I'm very I'm partly grateful for this show because it allows me to 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 like like Chan to open my mouth and say things and then say oh my George is going to put this through run this through a sieve and I'm going to have to reformulate it and do better which is good for all of us I th yeah. I'd just like to cut Chan some slack because I think well we're all on a journey to discovery um the fact that and, and and we're not all as well read as we ought to be um but but it's it's half full half empty um if if we can if our discoveries carry us and other people closer to Jesus, um, that's that's it. Who was it? It was it was um, the philosopher, your your American philosopher, the brother of the novelist. Um, oh, good grief! I'm getting old and I'm forgetting everything. Varieties Amos, of religious Amos Var Wilder, Thornton Wilder's brother. Varieties of religious experience. William Henry James. Will Henry William James. James. William James. Yeah. So William James said. Mm -hmm. uh, let's test things by the fruit that they produce if chan produces some people who love jesus in the eucharist then we can forgive him his lack of prep perhaps but but see it's not our job to forgive or to bless him um see there's a difference there's the time and a place for everything yes i agree entirely with you gavin and my demeanor and my thinking and my words as they appear in this medium are very different from what appears in a sermon and you're, you're, a very, you're, you're a very different person, Gavin, in your broadcasted sermons, because you are you have thought through the point that you're trying to make, and you and you don't make self awareness and discovery the point of your sermon. <laughs> That's true. That would be awful. Oh, thank God. <laughs> the, point your, the, point, the point of your sermon is to take the Bible, take the, whatever, take to the traditions, teach the sacraments. You're not doing anything original apart from the how you package these original thoughts if you're being faithful to your calling as a minister and and i don't wish to pick on chan either i'm not particularly interested in him i don't read his books i'm not a devotee of his but i hold the position of pastor a preacher to be so important and central that i really think you have to prepare yourselves and sort of be believe in what you're talking about yeah. Now, we... guys, 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 guys. Because we did this in two segments with that technical issue, you're about to go into recording a whole, whole other episode. So why don't we cut <laughs> it here? I'll put the, the, the two sections together. We'll get our 50 minutes. People will love us. There's like three or four people out there in the comments who say we go too long. We know. It, it, okay, you got us. We do go too long. The other ninety nine point well, we nine percent. We don't do, so we we don't do enough. piecework. Yet. We don't do piecework, Kevin. We do pay by the hour, and so pay if, by the hour. That's right. <laughs> so if we hit a certain um, mark, and yes, folks, Gavin has one clock that runs two minutes fast. And I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> runs four minutes slow. <laughs> Just when you thought it was over, there's more. <laughs> so we, we we have a six minute interval. Sorry, of, sorry, uh, sorry. Of clocks chiming. Now, somebody did say, "Why aren't you recording in your chapel anymore?" 
because I'm an old man and it's very cold. <laughs> you, don't, well, you just no heat in the chapel. Okay, There's no heat gotcha. in the chapel. It's extremely uh, cold and. Uh, um, uh and also well it's also to tell you the truth i'm in a bit of existential trouble i mean i the chapel is is where i go as a priest to celebrate the eucharist and i can't and You're so not a priest. You're, you give a well i think i i i <laughs> now we have <laughs> oh i could get in so much trouble i'm not yes. gonna go there <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm i can have it on tape <laughs> Ontological, epistemological suspension. Let's leave it there. <laughs> I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. And I'm the somewhat confused, existentially battered, and ontologically challenged Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to episode 566, only 100 to go before the big one. <laughs> <laughs>